I last saw my daughter in um, 2001. So she was four. She should be ten by now. And that, and that, and that is painful. That is. Marjorie was separated from her daughter in Uganda when she was arrested by government officials for her involvement in opposition politics. Her work, and subsequently her crime, was to help the women in her village know their rights and teach them to read and write. She escaped after months of imprisonment and relentless torture by digging a tunnel and managed to board a flight to the UK. I was raped, I was burnt, I was cut, I was electric shocked, no food, no medication. It was, it was really horrible, it was. On my flight to here, I didn't come with nothing. I just came with the clothes that I was putting on. And then um, I remember very well that uh, from Ithro, they gave me directions and I went to Croydon to seek asylum. When she reached the home office, staff at reception were so shocked by her physical state that medical assistance was called for her. The moment I reached into home office building, Duna House, an ambulance was called for me. Home office themselves, the home office officials, called an ambulance for me, and I went to Made the Hospital. Home office officials told Marjorie to come back to them to claim asylum once she had recovered. She did, but her claim for asylum was refused. For Marjorie, like most political asylum seekers, returning to her country of origin would mean certain imprisonment, torture, or death. At age 15, Bella was like any ordinary teenager. But a few days after these photos were taken, government officials came to her home in Uganda. They raped and abused her in front of her father to punish him for his involvement in opposition politics. With her life threatened, she escaped and was granted refuge in the UK as a child asylum seeker. But once she became an adult and had children of her own, she was no longer welcome to stay in the UK. One day I came back home from grocery shopping and there was a knock on my door and there were immigration uh, officers at the door and they handcuffed me. They put me in a van and took my, uh, my, my child away from me and um, they, took, they took us, they drove us to Yarlswood Detention Centre. Yarlswood is an immigration removal centre largely for the detention of women and children, a prison in all but name. Since its opening in 2001, damning reports paint a shocking picture of neglect and even cruelty towards the women and children inside. Investigations have led politicians, immigration experts and doctors to call for urgent measures, but reports of inhumane treatment still emerge daily from behind these walls. In detention, I wasn't an, allowed to be a mom. You can't carry your child. If you're used to carrying your child on the back, you're not allowed to carry the child on the back for health and safety reasons. And some children, like my son at that time, he was used to being carried next to me, and I felt like he needed that because he was in a strange situation. So it was some comfort for him because he's used to that. But you're not allowed. You're supposed to put him on the floor, or you're supposed to have a buggy. At lunchtime, they give you a particular portion. And if your child, for any reason, wants an extra portion, that's it. You're not allowed any extra portion. So in essence, you're not allowed to be a mom. You can't give your child an extra portion. Jubil is that child who will never ask for any more food. But one day, he was given noodles, and he wanted an extra portion. And everybody around me, the other detainees, they were all amazed 
and I was so pleased it never happened. It had never happened in she be two years of life to want an extra portion of food. So I was so delighted I walked back to the cafeteria lady and asked if my son could have an extra portion. And she told me no, cafeteria rules are that children can't have an extra portion. And of all my stay and all the hard things I've gone, I had gone through in the detention and all the fear of being deported, I, for some reason this was like the lowest point in my life because <laughs> for me here I was jubilating that my son for the two years of his life he's asked for an extra portion and here was this woman standing in the way of the extra portion of food that my son had asked for for the first time in his life. So I just broke down and cried in front of her. For me, I don't think someone should cry for a second portion for a child. I think that's wrong. And I think of all the things and all the pain, that was the worst thing for me as a detainee in Yowswood. too well the horrors of detention, having spent almost 10 months locked up here at Yarl's Wood. Fortunately for her daughter, she had someone on the outside she could trust to take care of her. But in the meantime, it meant months of separation. As an adult in detention, it's hard. How much more the kids? You only have to see the children. And you just look into their eyes and they just look very expressionless without any emotion whatsoever. I can't imagine what they must be going through. Naomi now visits Yarlswood regularly to try and help other detained women know their legal rights. She's part of a group called the Yarlswood Befrienders who bring toys and clothes for the children who would otherwise have nothing for months on end. It was difficult to get through each day, but you had to get through because you had a child who, 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 who didn't understand what was happening and who you didn't really want to understand what was happening. So it was a battle of staying strong and, and shielding your child as much as possible from whatever was happening around you. Two days later, I was taken to the airport to be deported to Uganda. Um, I told the people who were removing me, the escorts who were removing me, that I still had an, an outstanding claim. They told me that whatever outstanding claim I had, I should, I will be able to appeal when I'm in Uganda. I did not want to go on the plane, so I was carried onto the plane, and in that struggle, my hair was ripped out of my head and um, the shoes were torn and my son was carried away. I was forced into, into the seat and my hands were put behind my head and I had a, a man on each side of me and my hands were pulled like in handcuff position and my head was forced between my thighs that in the end, I was eating the seat that I was sitting on. And this man who was pulling my hand on one side told me that he, would ha he, will, he was determined to take me to Uganda even if he had to break my arms. When he told me that, <sighs> my heart broke down and I couldn't fight anymore. And I gave up. I was in such excruciating pain. It was... Um, like another horror, uh, like the horror of Uganda happening all over again. At the point when I had given up, a phone call came through and the judge had decided that I shouldn't be deported to Uganda because my son had not been given malaria vaccination. So I was taken off the plane 
I was told to sign on again at Croydon Reporting Centre, but based on what I had gone through and what had happened on the plane and the fact that these people knew everything I had gone through, but they were determined to torture me right to Uganda, I decided um, the best thing to do was to sit and wait until something will come through one day <laughs> that um, will grant me status. After these events, Bella lost faith in the system. And for her own safety and for the safety of her children, she decided to abscond, constantly moving from one address to another to avoid being caught. Marjorie has spent the past six years fighting the system legally. It has paid off. And now, with permanent status, she can finally apply for a visa for her daughter Sweetney to come and join her in the UK. This is the thing that I was waiting for for six years. Just this piece of a paper. Immigration status document. Residence permit for Julie Marjorie indefinite leave to remain in the United Kingdom. Yep. From the time that I got in this count in UK to the time that I was granted status, it took six years. You can't work, you can't go to college, you have to sign on. And then the waiting, the limbo, the not knowing what tomorrow holds for you. Whether tomorrow you're going to be deported back or whether tomorrow you're going to go in detention or whether tomorrow your, your, your accommodation is going to run out and you become destitute. I've lost six years of my life. Now I'm going to resume of, about my dream. And that dream is to be reunited with her daughter, Sweetney. I left her when she was a baby. She couldn't speak properly. But now, look, she looks like this. It was over six years ago when Marjorie took Sweetney to visit her mother, thinking she would shortly be back to pick her up. I never thought that that day that I saw my mother giving her my child would, would be the last time that, that I'll ever see her. Marjorie's mother, and Sweetney's only guardian, died early in 2008. On the day of her death, there was no one to come and pick Sweetney up from school. She's been living at the school ever since. Marjorie now hopes that the visa application for Sweetney to come to the UK will be processed quickly, so they can finally be reunited. The immediate thing that needs to be done for any child who's been separated from their parents is for them to be reunited. It can never be in a child's best interest to separate them from their parents. Essentially what the UK government has done is they've opted out of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, where refugee and migrant children are concerned. And what it allows them to do is it allows them to put immigration control before the best interest of children. Naomi, on the other hand, is fighting to prevent the Home Office from taking her daughter away from her. They have plans in place to do what is called a split family removal, in which the mother is sent back to her home country and the child is put into foster care elsewhere. In this case, due to tenuous family links in the US and for reasons that only the Home Office fully understand, Naomi's daughter is to be left in the hands of the United States foster care system to find a family there who will look after her. So she was ordered to report herself to Heathrow, even though she was only two, um, with 20 kilos luggage, and report herself to immigration in Heathrow, where she'd then be given her passport and she would board a flight to the US. In her battle to keep her daughter, Naomi has brought her case to the European Court of Human Rights. It wasn't until the morning of the removal itself that my mum got a letter through the door saying the removal had been stopped and my daughter had been granted further temporary admission. I've been told with the European Court it could take about two or three years before a decision's reached. So, you know, it's just a matter of waiting, really. You know, who makes a decision first, the Home Office or the courts? As Naomi waits to find out what will happen to her and her daughter, Marjorie's wait for Sweetney's visa application is over. 
The long-awaited letter from the British High Commission has just arrived. This is a letter to Sydney, my 10-year-old daughter, uh, from the UK, from the British High Commission of Uganda. Uh, a refusal of entry clear clearance. Uh, where are the reasons? There is no photographic or other evidence showing you and your mother together prior to our arrival in the UK. As such, you have failed to show that you are related to your mother as claimed and you therefore failed to meet the requirements of paragraph 27. Those are her names and her date of birth. She does not have anywhere to go other than staying in a school. She's 10. She can't... She can't look after herself. She needs someone to do that. And I do not think it's viable for others to leave school and then she stays. You know? Regardless of, of what the situation is, all she knows is my mother is there and I can be with her. With the visa application declined because of a lack of photographic evidence showing that Sweetney is indeed her daughter, Marjorie must now find a way to prove that she really is Sweetney's mother. Meanwhile, Bella tries to make a normal life for herself and her children while remaining invisible. I have tried to do everything that I would have done in my country. I've got two children and my partner's still with me. He's the father of my two children and I went to university. I've got a degree now. I graduated last July, a Bachelor of Science in Criminology. So I've really achieved um, all the education, academic aims I had, even when I was a little child. I would just like the freedom to enjoy my academic qualifications. I hope this stops at some point before um, my children get so into the motions of being an illegal immigrant. I hope one day my kids can be free to be children and not to have to worry about mommy being sad, mommy running around. I hope so my kids can have a normal life so that they can keep their friends, so that they can learn to have proper friendships, pro proper relationships for their own emotional well-being to aim high. Meanwhile, Naomi's life is on hold. She must report weekly to the local police station, while any day a decision could be made to go ahead with a split family removal. Naomi is not allowed to do anything until a decision has been made. I'm not allowed to work. I've got an identification card that has boldly written on it forbidden from taking employment. We get given weekly benefits of about 90 odd pounds every week. It's very difficult to survive on that little, you know, with a child. It's, it's almost impossible. In that 90 pounds, you have to feed yourself from the 90 pounds. You have to take transportation. You have to buy clothing, especially for a toddler who literally wears a few outfits and, you know, it doesn't fit anymore. You have to scrimp and save. You know, you have to cut out so many things you would otherwise want to buy in the supermarket or, you know, it, it just, it, sorry, it drives me nuts. In an attempt to help Marjorie gather photographic evidence of her relationship to her daughter, we are sending a camera with a video message to Uganda, on which Sweetney will record a reply. Hello Sweetney, it's Mama here. Um, how are you baby girl? I'm hoping you're fine. Um, I'm doing everything I can to see that um, they give you a visa, you come and join me. There's not a single day that has ever gone by without me not thinking about you. I love you, I miss you, and I want you to keep strong, you keep praying that um, we are going to be together because I know one day, one time we will. Love, Mama. Um, I... Okay. 